So welcome everyone. It's great to see lots of folk. Um, we've got folk here from a huge range of places from uh, across the Diocese of Bristol. Uh, Rona is joining us from Rutland and Megan is here from New Zealand. So uh, it's really good to have a, a huge range of, of folks with us. Rona, before we go any further, can I ask you if you'd just introduce yourself and say a bit about um, what you do and what your, what your interests are and what's led you to, to write this book on trauma? Yeah, of course. So I was a GP for 25 years doing a lot of stuff on well-being and ethics and towards the end I was doing a lot of on practitioner health and then I trained for ordination at Ridley and then I just began to encounter trauma in the church in a whole variety of different ways and so I did my master's there looking at flourishing and then I um, in curiosity was teaching at Lincoln School of Theology leading on pastoral care and ethics there and uh, the then principal Sally Myers and I put in a bid to the Common Awards um, to develop a training programme to train people to minister in times of trauma. And this came out of the work that was being done by Christopher Southgate in Exeter. And he and the team have been doing an awful lot of work on ministry in times of trauma for many years. And so really my interest in ongoing work now crystallised when I developed that training programme. We delivered it the, the autumn before COVID hit, not knowing how um, prophetic that was in many ways and how it prepared people for that time. So that's a bit of the story leading to my interest now. Thank you. And just to give folk an idea of the shape of the evening, what we thought we'd do is we'd talk a bit about um, Rona's work on trauma and her book, Mission, um, Mission in a Time of Trauma. And then um, we'll talk a bit about um, the book that I wrote about uh, for just such a time as this, uh, which is what Esther teaches us for, for ministry and mission in difficult times. And then we would talk together a bit about what, um, where the overlaps are and, and um, what kind of comes out of, of bringing those two things together. And there'll be space for questions along the way, we hope. So Rona, I think you've almost answered this in introducing yourself, but what was it that, that drew you into thinking and, and researching about trauma? So I explained the, um, the work we did to deliver this training programme. And then what really drew me was just noticing how many times trauma impacted on people's lives that maybe I haven't noticed before. So in healthcare, life gets interrupted. Um, and then we had the training program and then COVID hit. And it struck me very early on, we were looking at a complex glo global trauma. And it just felt that we needed to equip ourselves as um, ministers in the church in a whole variety of capacities, just to understand some of the models of trauma and to think about actually what is our calling at this time as the body of Christ um, in COVID. And the book idea came together actually incredibly quickly. Um, it kind of crystallized, I'm honest, in about half an hour about the shape of the book would actually be. And I really felt that was very much given the whole idea about it being mission in a time of trauma. And it was only um, a little bit later when I've been doing some more reading that I came across this very powerful quote by Diane Landsberg, where she says that trauma is the mission field of the 21st century. And the more I looked and the more I read and the more we move through trauma in COVID, the more this seemed to be so true. And so the book really came out of that, the desire to, yes, impart knowledge, but more to enable people to just to think about what is going on and what is our calling and how do we frame what we're doing at this time. So we'll come back to that mission side, but it's really good to hear that it was in there right from the start. Mm -hmm. um, but say something about how you understand trauma. Uh, I think you say somewhere in your book that it's about when 
it overwhelms our capacity to cope. What, yes. what does that, what does it mean for something to do that? Well, I'm gonna, I've written it down because I wanted to get it right, because I've got two definitions here. One is that trauma is a deeply disturbing event or series of events that overwhelms an individual or congregation's ability to cope. It's the one I use. But there's also a definition from Sophie Richards' book called Mending and the Mutes. It says this, a highly stressful situation that leaves the person emotionally, cognitively and physically overwhelmed, feeling helpless and vulnerable. And I think Sophie's definition is very good because it describes what actually this overwhelm is. Notice in your Esther book, you've got Esther and the sea is coming in and there's that feeling of overwhelm. But in trauma, the physical body goes into overwhelm. The nervous system goes into chaos and some people move into fight, flight type mode. Some people move into freeze mode. And it's the nervous system that kind of bumbles along in the background that is dictating what's happening. The person really isn't controlling it. And then you look at the emotional side of things and anxiety can become overwhelming. Depression, sadness, sorrow can all become overwhelming. And thought processes, Thought processes, you can get thought processes that actually dissociate, kind of the person kind of splits and partly dissociates. That can happen. Or sometimes you just ruminate and things go around in circles. Again, you can't control it. But there's also kind of spiritual trauma as well. And um, things like betrayal, um, which we see in quite a lot of areas of trauma, you can get heart wounds, that really deeply penetrating heart wound that takes a person into this place of overwhelm. If they're tired, if it's been going on for ages, if there's surprise, that makes trauma more likely, but it is just this overwhelming, being out of their comfort zone, not able to cope, haven't been here before. And it really, really hits in a way that they are overwhelmed and can't cope. And as Sophie Richard says, that leaves the, there's a vulnerability, there's a helplessness, a powerlessness that goes with that as well. And is there a clear dividing line between something being really hard and something being traumatic? I mean, what, at what point does it overwhelm, and overwhelm us, I suppose, is the and That's question. where it really depends on the individual. So one event can be perceived as one person as traumatic, whereas for somebody else it will not be perceived as traumatic. And we do know that people who have traumatic events in their childhoods may be more likely to perceive something as traumatic in later adult life. But we also know that in healthcare professions, in caring professions, in ministry, we hear stories of trauma. And we experience them vicariously, indirectly. And that can actually build up and build up and build up and then sometimes one thing one small thing will tip someone over from coping to overwhelm thank you how do we recover from trauma i mean do we there's um quite a bit of a debate do you use the term healing or don't you i like the term mending um, because I think we can mend. The scars are still there and the scars can be of different strengths, but the scar is still there. But I also like the concept of what's called post-traumatic growth. So many of you might be um, aware of the um, different models of grief that we talk about. And one of them has got the stages of grief. And it's a kind of curve that goes down and comes up. There are less models of trauma than there are models of grief. But one of the models of trauma just shows about how you go through different stages. But then as you come to the end, you move into what's called post-traumatic growth. And there's something about growing through it. 
that makes you stronger in some ways, but it doesn't negate what has actually happened and the scars still being there. So there's something really powerful there that relates to the, the resurrection appearances of, of Jesus with the, the scars and the marks of the nails. Um, it was, yes, and, and, and about how, it, how our scars actually can form part of ministry. That's right. And, and I kind of love the Emmaus story. I use the Emmaus story a lot in when we're looking at trauma because what you've got is you've got the two disciples walking to Emmaus and then this stranger comes along and walks beside them. They don't see the scars. Hmm. And they just tell him what's happened and they're telling him all this stuff. And then he says, don't you know? Don't you understand? Let me tell you. And so he then listens to their story and listening and witnessing a story is really important in trauma. But then he gives them the bigger picture. He then reframes it. And then they sit down to eat and he breaks the bread. Was that when the scars were visible? I don't know. And they recognize and they know. So for me, the Emmaus story with the scars in the hands of Jesus, as he reframes that story, but as he listens, kind of just shows for those disciples a bit of their journey through the trauma. I doubt they'll forget it, forget what happened. They will have scars inside from what they've heard and what they've seen, but it's been reframed into that bigger picture, that bigger story. That's really helpful. I don't think I've ever thought of the Emmaus road story that way i think it's the the conversation in the bible i'd most like to have eavesdropped on mm, yeah um but uh because we get we just get the kind of introduction to it we we don't get the kind of detail which would be much more interesting I think. But there we are. um so how does trauma then work with groups of people i mean you talk about it working trauma working out in congregations mm. Yeah. I mean, a lot of work has been done in the States. And then, as I said, Christopher Southgate and his team have done a lot of work in the UK as well. And there is that grief shaped curve that we see with congregations and communities. And I mean, I was part of a, a church for many years where we had some significant traumas. We had teenagers die, we had people in train crashes, we had a lot of stuff happen. And as I look back, I can see the model I'll describe in a minute happening there. But I think COVID is actually the best, best illustration to describe this model. And the model really has five stages to it. The first stage is that people go into overdrive, into frenetic activity, into what's called the heroic stage of the, of the, of the um, journey. I'm going to see if I can get a picture to show you on the screen. No, I can't, I can't do it. Sorry. Um, I should have thought about that. Um, and then after, and we saw that with COVID, we saw everybody running around, putting services online, goodie bags for people, pyramids of care, frenetic activity, we'll soon get back to normal. Frenetic activity, we'll soon get back to normal. And then there was this disillusionment phase where people were beginning to get tired. There was, again, we heard this kind of desire to go back to the way things were, where some people were saying, actually, we're going to be moving forward to the new normal, but there was disillusionment, overactivity, hyperactivity, heroic phase, moving into disillusionment. And then there is this rock bottom phase, the rock bottom phase where actually the reality begins to hit. And at that stage, the loss begins to be accepted. And we could see in congregations again this isn't done at the same rate by the same people but the pattern is very very similar the loss is accepted and then there is a, a rebuilding phase where people then begin to look at okay this is where we are how do we move forward i think we're beginning to see that now we're beginning to be, see people reflect on you know where we are we're getting analysis done of the data of what's happening to church attendances in different ways we're getting a recognition that actually people leading ministry are so, so, so tired. And then there's a plan as to what, actually how do we move forward? What is the thing we need to do now? Where is God leading at this stage? 
how do we begin to rebuild in this current context? And then you get what's called a wiser living stage where we've learned by experience. So that is the kind of journey through community and congregational trauma. The problem is COVID has been a complex trauma. It's been one trauma on top of another, on top of another. As we had lockdown one, we had lockdown two. We then add into that the whole issue of um, people not being able to get to funerals, not being able to get to weddings. It sounds small, but lost holidays can be very big for people. Lack of access to health care has led to other forms of bereavement as well. Families living at other sides of the world haven't been able to see each other physically. Touch, so important for some people. Connection, people living on their own who didn't have a bubble. Loss of connection, that's traumatic as well. And so when we look at COVID, we see a significant complex trauma, which really compromises the shape of that curve of response. And now we add in Ukraine, which for many people, the reverberations are global and it is traumatic. It's traumatic for people going through it, but it's also vicariously traumatic for people looking at it. So the journey through trauma for an individual is that kind of curve shape. And I'm sure in 50 years time, we'll have as many models of trauma as we have of grief and how we process it. It's a similar kind of curve that we see in congregational and community trauma. But nothing is as simple and as linear as the graphs because life is more complex as we're seeing. But understanding the pattern helps. Understanding that actually this too will pass helps. Understanding there will be a wiser living phase, there will be post-traumatic growth for the community helps. And our question is how do we enable people to take that journey? And you've mapped some of that onto the five marks of mission. Mm. Which I thought yes. oh, that was that was something in in your book that I thought was just really brilliant. Um, it's one of those things that afterwards I thought that's really obvious, but it was only when I read it in your book that it became obvious. So the, the great gift there was unpacking that. Could you say some a bit about how the five marks of mission map onto trauma? Yeah, I mean there is the um, the telling of God's big story the whole way that God's power, all power um, omnipotence, his all powerfulness is a way of helping people to negotiate trauma because power, a lot, trauma is about loss of power. And so the big story that Jesus told as Emmaus reframes and holds all that we do in, in trauma care. Yeah. But it's also pastoral care. It's actually caring for people at the cold face. And in doing that, we actually proclaim the good news of a God who loves and a God who cares and a God who holds a bigger story. And so in doing that, we serve human need. There's also something about um, challenging injustice. And I'll give an illustration for that. So at a, a church nearby to us, um, on a Friday morning for many years, they've had um, a cafe within the church building itself. And it's aimed at those for whom life is tough and hard. Homeless people, people who are struggling to get by, uh, needing food banks, needing Christian aid, uh, uh, the, the, the cap, the, um, the financial type stuff, needing signposting to counselling, needing accommodation, et cetera, et cetera. So it is a hub where people meet once a week. It's held in the church, the good news is proclaimed. There's significant pastoral care that goes in, but also there's a huge challenging of injustice. And in doing that, there is a renewal of life. 
And so in doing that, I think you kind of cover all the marks of mission. I mean, the phrase I've got, and I, I read it, and I'm sure it wasn't for me in the end, I'm sure the spirit led it, was, it says, I say this, in times of trauma, mission is trauma-informed pastoral care as the why of the big story of the good news is proclaimed. Human need is served. People are nurtured in adversity. Unjust structures are challenged and life is renewed. And good trauma care, that's what it is. Good pastoral care, that's what it is. It's Wait. mission and it's ministry and you can't separate the two. It does, it does seem to me that one of the things that we learned as a church through the COVID season was that pastoral care and mission are not separate things. No. Um, and we see that in Jesus. Hmm. We see that in Jesus all the time. Hmm. I'm going to open it out now and see if anyone else has questions to you about, okay. about trauma and mission and church communities so please use your put your hand up on the uh, on the zoom hands and uh we've had a request in chat rona if you could put some of those definitions into into chat that you that you kicked off with yeah i'll try and do that, that if not great. i can email it out through event bright afterwards would that be okay i'm sure that'll be great yeah yeah okay. everyone's bit david i mean this is i could talk about lots of other aspects but just out of interest on the congregation side um the issue of those who've not returned because it feels i was talking to someone at the weekend where they they've got about 80 percent back now there's that there's going to be that ongoing sense of loss as a congregation it's not just about people who died or are now too ill to come some people have now and, and even in large churches, I mean, until recently, I was in Bath and Wells uh, working, and one of their very large churches is, is experienced a really serious drop in one of the very large ones, you know. And I, I when you've got that, you think, you know, it feels like, I mean, I, I, I helped, well, I was involved a bit when someone was at County Council cut loads of jobs, and there was this feeling in, in some departments of yeah. your arm being cut off because a, depart, a whole department had gone, and people used to work with were no longer there. And I just wonder how you deal with that that level of, of trauma because that feels like it's a, a fairly permanent state until hopefully some of these congregations do renew themselves. But that that we're talking about a few years, aren't we, before that anything like that would happen? If if we're talking about eighty percent of, let's say twenty percent of people not coming back in some cases. And I think what you described there is that there are so many more ramifications, and there's something there about a recognition of what's happening. Um, kind of naming the black stone what is it that's happening and then working out how do we rebuild mm -hmm. how do we move forward within this particular context and I think for different communities there's going to be different things and echoing what you said about numbers going down but there's also something about a lot of people going to services that are kind of 200 miles away going to services in America mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. the UK yeah, yeah, yeah. so we're in a different climate and actually what are we in where do we need to go? What is God calling us to do at this stage? I think that will lead in quite well to Simon's book later, actually. Megan has a question. This is coming uh, from the other side of the world. Yes. So we're in a, a bit of a different context. Um, Ten years ago, we had massive earthquakes, which decimated a third of the city. And it, we had something like 18,000 earthquakes. So what is solid ground shifted for us. Yeah. Um, but part of what happened was the length of time of the trauma has led to unhealthy behaviours. Like there is a huge culture of uh, the adoration of um, busyness. And if someone is stressed, they're more valued. Uh, and... I'm interested now that we have another prolonged uh, traumatic event in COVID about the length of time of a traumatic event 
and how that sets behaviour in our churches and what it's going to take for us to shift those behaviours. Because I know there is another layer here now, but we can't quite see it. We can get a sense of it, but we can't <coughs> quite see it because we're in the midst. I'm not sure if I'm being clear. That's really That's... interesting. So I think what I hear you saying is that with the earthquakes, what you noticed is that because of the length, the trauma behaviours were changing. Oh, absolutely. Even our blood markers have changed. Um, so, and there's now a group of children who've grown up under a different ethos in the 10 years. So, you know, it, it goes through education, everything. But what I'm interested now with the layer of COVID is what are the behaviours that are being reinforced through um, the continuing trauma of COVID, because it's not finished. Um, and in the sense of the church, how we identify those behaviours and wrestle with using, our, um, using the gospel to realign ourselves into healthy behaviours. And Megan, can I ask you, because when you're doing research in this area, are you, have you got any insights from that that would be really worth sharing with the group here at the moment? Uh, I think the insights that I'm getting at the moment is um, about radical hospitality uh -huh. and uh, about the shared experience, which says, um, I don't care where you've come from. And actually people's need to hear that the church is there is not going to judge you for walking in the door. Um, it actually needs to be outside the door. Both my churches fell down. We combined, we rebuilt a new church. Um, and the space in front of the church <clears throat> is as important as the building because people become very attached to the buildings. They don't want to get outside of them but now it's getting people out of the houses. Um, so in part, it's uh, for us trying to think of ways that we extend that radical hospitality because that is what's allowing people, allowing us to enter people's homes effectively and entice them out into their front yard and then hopefully a bit further out. That's really interesting. So whereas we used to say you couldn't get people into church, now we can't get them out their homes. Absolutely. So we've, yeah. we've, we're developing a pathway project, Stepping Stones. So it starts online, then face-to-face, -face, gentle step, step, step. Um, yeah. And that echoes again a lot of the trauma stuff, which is actually don't look to next week, just take one step at a time. Yes. Thanks so much for that, Megan. Thank you. Lydia, can we come to you? And then Simon has a question and then I think we will move on. Uh, my question was about children and young people. Do they experience trauma? Like, do they do the same curve? And do they do it faster or slower? Um, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, does it affect children and young people similarly, differently? Obviously, the younger they are, the less they can articulate. So that's quite in, that's a sort of interesting aspect as well, if you know anything about that. Well, first of all, to say I'm not an expert in child and trauma. Uh, we know that adverse childhood incidents are significant and they impact on children later on in life as well. And I think we're going to see that COVID has been an adverse childhood incident for, for many children globally. As to how to process that, I'm really not an expert in that at all. And I really can't comment. However, I would note that it's not just children, and I'm not being lighthearted here, it's dogs as well. So children who've been born in COVID, they weren't socialising, their speech has been noticed by many parents to be delayed, their socialising activity has been delayed. They're living with parents who are anxious, where life has been different, where parents or one parent has been working from home, while the children have been cared for in the background, that's going to have huge ramifications, but we don't actually know what they are. And I think there's going to have to be some ongoing work on that. 
And I mentioned the dogs because I've got friends who are dog owners who are saying that dogs bought in COVID are nervous and not so used to socialising. So actually, the ramifications are huge in a whole variety of ways. Um, I'm just trying to think, I'll try and get a decent book or recommendation of a book on children and trauma for you, Lydia. But that's not an area I can really comment on very well at all. I'm sorry. Hmm. And Simon. Rona, thank you. So many things I'd like to say, but what one bit of your area, so... Uh, I'm in Swindon, Old Town Swindon. Uh, we have three adults uh, baptised, confirmed uh, from Iran and Iraq from the harbour. My question is about trauma across ethnic groups. The Bristol Diocese are linked to the church in Uganda, and their phrase is, God is good all the time, all the time God is good. I'm just interested in, I suppose, what we discovered uh, through the gift of our friends Iran and Iraq was lament and hope but in terms of what does your study in a multicultural place like Swindon multi-ethnic group how we can love other cultures ethnicities but also what is wise theology in a very turbulent age so I think first of all I found it very interesting that having never I think heard a sermon on lamentations or on Joe, I've heard about some on Joe, but not very much Lamentations. And in churches that didn't use the Psalms very much, suddenly we're hearing so much in churches nationally about lament, Lamentations, Job. Um, sermons about lament, lament being encouraged. There is, um, I, I think the Psalms are something that's actually very, very powerful because they're kind of the people of God crying out to God. And I think that transcends all cultures. So I've been doing a lot of prayer stations over COVID and I've been accessing music from a whole variety of different places to, to use in these stations. And, and the Psalms are universal. You get them in so many different languages. And the Psalms enable us to say those hard things that we can't put into words ourselves. I think there's something also about creativity in its different shapes and forms of being very useful. We often, um, I think, default to words, um, but actually sometimes a silent space with some quiet music in the background um, and a simple cross in the center and just sitting and being together can be enough. Um, I do some creative arts workshops, how about those at New Wine, and, and it's very interesting, you get people from a whole variety of backgrounds that will come in and pray with stuff, praying with stuff, creating stuff, and actually if you look at trauma therapy, there's a lot of creativity used in trauma therapy, the idea being that actually in the creating, you're actually fulfilling some of the um, some way of bringing what's hidden inside that can't be verbalized into the outside in a way that can be contained that enables you to move forward. For many, communion, Eucharist, is a key part of their spirituality. And that is embodied. That's tasting, touching, sensing, smelling. It's community, it's gathering. So Eucharist can be a way that transcends you know, wherever we are as the body of Christ. But I think it's important that it is God-focused and what we do needs to be God-focused. It needs to be trauma-informed. It needs to be pastorally held. We need to use liturgy in its diverse ways, not just with words. And we need to be creative. And I think in doing that, we're going to be able to help people from all different kinds of backgrounds by listening to what they can bring, by being the body of Christ together, learning from each other. So I don't think that gives you a complete answer, but it gives you some things that might be helpful to, to guide and um, consider. Brilliant answer, just very briefly, on Good Friday, my friend led us in a messy Good Friday. So I was using um, plasticine in a new way, but actually mm -hmm. there, were, there was a table of crosses around the world. Yeah. And for our three friends, have a cross, 
which was Iberian bullet, and made out of a bullet, was very profound for them on Good Friday. Yeah. And I'd echo that. And there's a very good book about crosses around the world. Okay. And um, nails, actually making crosses with wire and nails can work as well. So all those kind of creative activities could be really powerful. So thank you for that, Simon. Rona, thank you. Um, if you go to the top of the, the very top of the chat, what Rona has put in there is a website about um, trauma and congregations. Um, it's a resource that's there. So do find that in the chat. You'll also find at the, at the top of the chat, you'll find links to the Grove Books website where you can find uh, Rona's book, Mission in a Time of Trauma, and, um, and our emails. So that's all in the chat for you if you want to find that. What I'm going to do now, Rona, is just make you um, a co-host so that you can handle okay. some, uh, some questions in a, in a bit. Um, and we're going to switch over. So Rona is going to ask me some questions now. So Simon, your book on Esther, I think you already know I, I love Les Esther. I always have done. I've got a picture of the Gospel of Esther by my bed, bedside table as well. But I'm just wondering, you kind of say in, in your book that you discern a pattern in Esther where there's a call, there's a need, and there's a calling out of the call. And I'm just wondering how that's mirrored in your call to write this book on Esther. So very pragmatically, what this arose out of was I spent quite a lot of the first lockdown in trying to work out how to get people ordained and what we were going to do if we couldn't get people ordained. Um, and what we ended up with was um, we had to license those who were due to be ordained deacons, so those who were leaving theological college and, and coming into ministry needed to be licensed as lay workers because that enabled us to pay them and that was quite important. Um, and those who were due to be ordained priests needed their licenses extending because they'd only got a license up until the point that they were due to be ordained priest. And I thought that particularly for those coming into uh, ordained ministry, uh, well, into, not into not ordained ministry, but into ministry out of college, this was actually quite a significant moment that wasn't an ordination and there was some disappointment there. But it wasn't just, it was all going to have to happen over Zoom. Um, and it, it wasn't something that we should take lightly. So I thought we'd, I called it a micro retreat. And I said, we'd, we'd spend a day. Um, and if I'm, if I'm really, really honest, I really wasn't sure how even hoping that we could get to physical ordinations later in the year, how we would manage a retreat. So it was partly about playing on, um, learning about mm. how, we, how we might do a retreat online. And in the end, we, we managed to do um, a retreat in person without, without the retreat bit. We, 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 people came in, we spent a day together and then went away. Um, but for this, we had a day with a few sessions online and Esther, I can't honestly tell you why it was Esther that popped into my, into my head. But I, I started doing some work on Esther in order to prepare for this. And the more I got into it, the more it felt that this was really a book for dealing with complex and difficult times, because there are no simple answers in Esther. Mm. And the kind of Sunday school version of Esther really doesn't do it justice it's a rich book there's some really um there's some really dark humor in it there's um so I came to really love it as I worked on it more and more yes you talk about the humor and the horror the hilarity and the horror yes I mean sometimes in the face of really hard things um a kind of very peculiar kind of humour comes out. Um, and so with Esther, I think at the very beginning of Esther, there's a banquet thrown 
which lasts for six months. I mean, it's just, um, and the, the picture of, um, of the king that is presented is, is of someone who really doesn't know what's going on anywhere. Um, it's, and as the book goes on, he doesn't care what his lead minister is doing. He just doesn't, he doesn't know, and he's not worried by it. He gets worried later, and Esther is able to, I think, quite skillfully manipulate him. Um, but it's, it's a very, uh, there's quite a cartoon version of the, of the king that's painted. And in, and in parallel to that, you've got a very, a very nuanced painting of, of Esther and of the Jewish community um, who, are, um, who are in the real, who are going through real difficulty. Thank you for that. In your book, you um, include quite a number of powerful examples. So for example, Marcus Rashford, Gary. And I'm just wondering, why did you choose to include the examples you did? How did you decide what to include? Maybe which one spoke to you most powerfully to you as a, an author with a link with Esther? I think it's partly trying to ground it in, in stories. And um, some of them, like Marcus Rashford, um, like there's a, a lovely story about a, a homeless guy who it's only when he speaks that they realise why people aren't coming into the shelters. It's because homeless people love their dogs. dogs. It's back mm -hmm. to dogs. Um, and some of them are kind of anonymized and, and, uh, and smoothed out so that they can't be attributed versions of um, stories that I, I'm aware of from ministry that I've been involved with or encountered over, the, over my time in ministry. Partly it was about trying to, to make it um, very broad so that I was really keen that this wasn't um, wasn't just about ministry, meaning ordained ministry. This is about ministry, meaning what Christians are called to do, um, and that could be Christians who are ordained, but it could equally be Christians who have uh, jobs which are themselves a form of ministry, or do ministry through the church or outside the church I, I wanted it to be a very broad way I, I you know whether I've managed that or not is a different question but um uh it was about trying to get a breadth of understanding of ministry mm. um and yeah and just trying to to kind of yeah. ground it in ground what what I was trying to draw out of Esther in in, in kind of real life stories. Yeah, I read the Marcus Rashford story and I hadn't realized that. And it's just the whole thing about how a whole life trajectory, his whole life trajectory led him to that place at that time to make that difference and how God wastes nothing. It's a lovely phrase, how God wastes nothing. I think yeah. that's right. Um, and I think with the Marcus Rashford story, it was almost a sense of he would be betraying where he came from if he didn't do that. Uh, whilst at the same time he's got um, the politicians saying well he should just get on with playing football yeah. and parallels there with Esther again as you pointed out when you're in your book you, you talk about the fact that God's not mentioned in Esther like God's not mentioned explicitly in Song of Songs and and about God's absence and God's presence I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about that <laughs> It's one of those pub quiz questions, isn't it? With, you know, is there a book in the Bible which doesn't mention God? Um, and I think that there is something really important in the book of Esther about the, the absence of the explicit naming of God. Uh, they've, the, later, the later versions of the book of Esther fix it. There's a, there's a Greek version of Esther that adds in 
all kinds of bits. And I think it's, uh, I think it ruins the book. Um, I think it, it makes the book much more about Mordecai than about Esther. It, um, and it becomes a much more conventional, much smoother book. Whereas I think what's, what's really the great gift of the book of Esther is just how spiky it is and how difficult it can be. Um, so the absence of God, well, I think what I say is it's not that God's absent, it's, it's that he's not named and that it's really interesting that the feast that comes out of the story of Esther, the Feast of Purim, which is named for lots, so sort of casting out dice, um, and, and a lot is a poor, and Purim is plural. So the, the, is there a second dice being thrown? Is God doing stuff in the background? It's, um, is I think, a kind of live question, or one that we should certainly be asking as we read the book of Esther is where is God in this? Mm. Um, and sometimes in the face of really difficult things, I think to kind of instantly say, well, God's here. Oh, there was God. Um, can really close things down and really be, well, it's usually wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it doesn't take seriously the difficulty that people are having in the face of really hard circumstances. And I think sometimes what it's about is, you know, what, what we're called to as, as Christians is sometimes just to simply hold the space for God yeah. and to do things which allow there to be space for God to show up um, and to learn to recognise God when God does show up, and which might not be in neat and obvious ways mm, yeah thank you for that yeah yeah Lydia and I were at um when we were on the, on the conference here uh we're at college with a lass who did her, her master's research looking at Psalm 88 Olga and um she came up with this term God's hostile presence nice. but God is present and uh another book that was saying that with the Psalms, in Psalm 88, there is no resolution, but there is someone that can be known to. I think what's, a, uh, what's fascinating about the Psalms is that we never teach people to pray like that. Mm. We always teach people to pray in much more um, smooth and, and polite ways. Whereas the Psalms are full of people essentially shouting and kind of um, waving their fists at God and getting really cross with God. And certainly in the Church of England, we're not very good at that. We don't like, we don't like that kind of prayer. Um, and that kind of links with what you bring in your book as well, which is about um, in Esther looking for where we can note the presence of God and the habit of being able to look back and notice the presence and notice the miracle. I'm wondering what does that look like in individual and community life today when people are actually in a situation maybe a bit like Esther? I think there's something about, well, there's, a, there's an old contemplative discipline of, of the examine of looking back over uh, a day or a week or a period in life and seeing where were the moments of uh, of consolation where were the, the moments that actually things were uh, were good or were were feeding us where are the moments of desolation where were we where were we hurt where were we um and seeing god in both um and then also looking back and seeing where God was in that time. And it is a backward looking discipline. It's hard to do that on a communal basis, but I think, I think we can. I think um, all of it has to be f done prayerfully. Um, it, it is about that discernment of where God was 
present and asking God to show us where God was present. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we, sometimes we notice God at the time. Sometimes we don't. Um, sometimes as we look back, we think really we should have noticed God. And if we had noticed God, perhaps things would have been different. Sometimes God was there kind of holding us and we might not have spotted it, but actually that's all right because that, you know, what God was doing was simply holding us there. Um, I remember, oh, a while ago now, cause when Rowan Williams was Archbishop of Canterbury, and there was a shooting in a, in a school in Russia. Um, and he was asked by John Humphreys, where was God? And Rowan took a moment to pause and then said, well, God was where God always is. God was in the bonds of love between the people in the hands that were held, in the, in the comfort that was offered, even in the face of um, uncertainty and death. And um, it's hard to see God sometimes, but I think we're committed as Christians to a belief that God is, God is present. But God's not always easy. Um, that um, God isn't tame. We don't we don't look for the we don't find God only in one kind of thing. God's present in it all. There's maybe something there about PCC meetings could start with a communal examine. How do we use a communal examine in church? That would be. Uh, that would be very powerful, I think. Imagine if, if every PCC in in the uh, let's go for a diocese rather than the whole country, but you know, um, were to to decide that for for a season, they would begin with an examine every time they met. It's also part of how we discern where God is calling us on to in the future. I mean, it is backward looking, but it's but it's future focused. Um, we look to see where God was so that we can see where God is calling us. Um, the, and that's the very things much. Are not, yeah. Okay. That's very much the way that the Hebrew people, the Israelites, did that, wasn't it? As well, looking back to the future. You mentioned feasting and fasting. <laughs> Ten feasts, I think it was. There's a lot of feasts in the book of Esther. <laughs> a lot of drinking and eating goes on. <laughs> You've touched it a bit. A bit already, but could you just say a little bit more about it? Why go and put the light on? Okay. <laughs> yeah, can you say a bit more about the feasting and the fasting? Well, the feasts in Esther are the are the points where things move. They're the, they they drive the narrative. So right at the start of the book, you have the feasts that that end up with Vashti being. Um, removed and that creates the the narrative space for Esther to come in and then you've got the kind of feasts that Esther holds um, which are right at the heart of the story and that's that's where everything changes um, and it ends with a with a feast that Mordecai and Esther commission it's almost it's almost a change you know there are moments of that where they the plot moves on, but there are also moments of reversal. And so that the Persian feasts at the beginning of the book become the two Jewish feasts at the end of the book. Um, and just the fact that for the first ones are Persian and the second and the end ones are, are Jewish is itself a huge reversal in power and in focus and in all kinds of things. And, and of course, that's the ones at the end of the book are celebrating the victory that Esther and Mordecai have won um, at some considerable cost. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and there's not a lot of fasting, but there is a bit, and crucially, there are there are fasting um, when when the decree to annihilate the Jews is read, and then Esther fasts and calls others to do it. 
and then then at the end she does make fasting part of the observance of of Purim it becomes known in the Jewish tradition as Esther's fast um, and Purim is one of the it's one of the more fun Jewish feasts that it's got kind of elements of pantomime and elements of uh, of kind of what happens on Halloween in our culture with people Indeed. dressing up in different cultures and yeah um, and there's and you're supposed to get um, you're supposed to get decidedly drunk um, at Purim so that you can't tell the difference when the story is read between Haman and, um, and Mordecai which are not very similar names um, so fasting is fa feasting is, is it's just really important um, it's about saying that actually in moments of of joy sometimes in the face of um, of sorrow things can be changing um, a good funeral is a time of mourning but it can also be a time of celebration I say a good funeral and not every funeral will be that there will be times of tragedy but it it does give us the chance to celebrate there's a sometimes I, I find there's a kind of people try and draw a distinction between a funeral as mourning the, the death of someone and a kind of um, service of celebration of someone's life and I, I've never seen the difference the two are intimately bound up mm. because when when we gather to remember someone um, we should be we should be able to celebrate and actually the celebration of how wonderful that person's life was is what makes it so sad and the two you can't remove the two I, I've often said to people who want to give the uh, give the eulogy at, at one of their loved ones funerals that if you can make us laugh with a story from the person then that's really good because it means you will have connected with people and with the life of the person you're telling the story about so it's not coming out and and reeling off jokes mm -hmm. it's telling a story that's of that person that actually connects enough to make people laugh which comes back to the humor the horror the humor and the horror all go together you mentioned the feasts going from the two persian feasts to the jewish Jewish feasts at the end and the cost there's a lot of violence in Esther. It's not a book for pacifists. Um, I think it's a, I think it's a really difficult book for violence. What the Jews are being threatened with annihilation, and because of um, what seems a kind of legally a very legalistic and rather stupid feature of Persian law. Um, they can't cancel the edict that all the Jews should be uh, should be killed. All they can do is issue a new edict which says the Jews are allowed to fight back and then it simply becomes a question of who can win. Um, but I think there's something quite deep going on in the book of Esther and, and subtly all the way through we're seeing the playing out of what I think is the most difficult passage of the whole of the scriptures, which is that passage in um, 1 Samuel where the Israelites are commanded to wipe out the Amalekites. And because they don't, Saul is removed from being king. And we're told really early on that Haman actually comes from uh, is distant, you know, his, his ancestors are Amalekites, and that Mordecai uh, is a distant uh, descendant of King Saul. And there's something about the working out of old grudges, old conflicts, old trauma even, in, in what goes on. And it, it, it's written in such a way that, um, when the Jews, the, the book underlines three times that not just uh, Haman is killed, but the, Haman is killed on the scaffold that he's made to, to kill Mordecai, but his three sons are killed um, 
in the fight with the Jews. And it, it is, that is the, the Bible bringing a, an end to that feud, I suppose. And it's just right, you know, deliberately underlining that, that now what didn't happen in 1 Samuel has been fulfilled in, in Esther. But it's not been fulfilled in an easy and um, kind and clear way. It's been fulfilled by the annihilation of a family. Um, but it is, it is a book about struggle. Um, and there is, the, the Jews have to fight for their deliverance. They don't, Esther doesn't win the, the internal battle in the court and then everything is fine. Mm. Actually, you have the internal battle of, in the court, which Esther does win. And then the Jewish people have to, to, to fight for their deliverance from their enemies. So it, it's, not a, it's not a neat book, it's not an easy book, but there is, there is quite a lot of violence in it. Um, and it's, and you can't, you can't strip it out, it's not incidental. I'm not sure whether that helps. It does, thank you. You, you um, kind of commented as well in your book about Ben Lindsay looking at Esther and the sexism, the anti-Semitism and the racism within it. You also commented about Esther's fear. And I'm just wondering, looking at the time, would it be good to go with Esther's fear or would you like to go with the Ben Lindsay stuff at the moment? Shall we go with Esther's fear? Because I suspect yeah. the Ben Lindsay stuff will come out also when we try and pull what we've done together. Yeah, fine. Um, I think Esther's fear is one of the reasons why she's such an attractive character. Because there's, she's not the hero that sees the need and flies into the res to the rescue. Um, she, she's got a nice safe position. She's, she's, she's cared for, um, and she's, um, she's safe. And, and there's a reasonable prospect, Mordecai tries to play this down, but I think there's a reasonable prospect that if she keeps her head down, They've kept secret the relationship between Esther and Mordecai. She might well survive Haman's purge of the Jews. Um, and she has to be persuaded to take a stand. And she's seen, she's seen what happened to Vashti, who took a stand, because that's what happened. You know, that's what enabled Esther to get into that position of relative safety. Um, and Vashti is a very strong woman. Mm. To, the, you know, the courage that Vashti has to stand up to, um, to the king and to refuse his instruction. Um, but that, that ends Vashti's place. Esther, Esther takes a more compromising a more tactical role um, and it seems to be of a piece with her character she's she's cunning and and this is the book of the bible that kind of it really values the cunning and the ability to navigate complex political and um, difficult situations rather than pure heroism that strides in on a white charger and sorts everything out. Um, so Esther's fear is really important. And of course, being the book of Esther, this is all played out in one of the most hysterical conversations that you could ever have with both Mordecai trying to persuade Esther to act and Esther initially refusing. It's all done through intermediaries. They never actually meet to, to have the conversation. It's all done by Esther sends, a, a, um, a eunuch to Mordecai and Mordecai gets the eunuch to re relay the message it's all done at you know it's all done through third parties it's um, we're back to the the dark humor of, of the yeah. book of Esther yeah and yet 
as you point out, the eunuchs are all named. That was, just noticing that was astounding. Um, even I think the most famous eunuch in the Bible, who is the Ethiopian eunuch in the book of Acts, is never named. And yet Esther has four or five um, who are all given names. Um, and there's something there about Esther recognizing her place on the outside and actually valuing the people who are also there on the outside. And it's quite clear Esther would not have been in quite such a good position had the eunuchs not helped her in all kinds of ways. Um, it so, makes me think about, you've called me by name. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The last little bit I'd like to look at is your comparison between Esther and Wonder Woman. Ah, <laughs> uh, okay. What, how did you come up with that? And just tell us, because you've got some lovely parallels between the two there. <laughs> so, uh, my friend Joe um, sent me um, uh, uh, an article from a Jewish newspaper that talked about Wonder Woman um, as being a really popular costume for Jewish girls at Purim. And, and this gave me the excuse to, to force my children to sit down and watch the, uh, the 2017 film um, Wonder Woman. And it, it's largely because um, Gal Gadot, who plays Wonder Woman, is, is, an, is an Israeli actor. That's one of the reasons why it's come in. But there are some, you know, you've got a strong woman in, in both of those, and they're playing the title role in the stories, which is just as unusual in the Bible as it is in comic books. I mean, there aren't many lead women. It, it's, it took the Marvel Universe, I don't know how many films before, a woman on her own was the, was the named character in a film. Um, they both got two, they, they both have kind of two lives. There's um, Wonder Woman has this alter ego as Diana, who's kind of prim and, and slightly quiet and then um, turns into Wonder Woman to, to, to save the world. And Esther is a Jewish girl called Hadassah. That's rather than Esther, who's the queen of Persia. So there are those... And there's even, I think, a marvellous moment when um, preparing for the, preparing to go and, and meet with the king, Esther goes and changes into her costume. She goes and beautifies it and puts her, puts her robes on. And that's the point at which she begins the plan. So there's that kind of, but there's lots of ways, of course, in which she's not like Wonder Woman. Um, and we've talked a bit about Esther's not quite a hero, she actually takes the real, I mean, what's astounding in the book of Esther, and particularly, and, and this is particularly undermined, I think, by the Greek editions, is that she's a real political leader by the end. She's, um, with all of the complexity and ambiguity of being a political leader. Um, and Wonder Woman is a straightforwardly heroic comic book figure. And that's where, it, falls down but having been sent that article about Purim and Wonder Woman it would have been churlish not to find the uh, the way of including that. Thanks so much for that Simon. Does that seem like a good place to leave that part that of it? That sounds like a good place yeah. So we've had some requests in chat to to repost some, some links which I will do but yeah. Right, so uh, chat wise, um, are there any questions that people would like to ask Simon now? I can't actually see, but I don't think I can now. Yes, any hands up to ask any questions of Simon? Silence. Wave at the view. Uh, yes, Megan. Megan's got a question. Megan, do you want to unmute yourself and ask a question? I was just wondering, Simon, um, there's the interesting sort of piece where Esther uh, 
it's not just Esther. She gathers the community around her to enter into the same process, um, her servants, etc. So like once she makes the big decision, uh, she isn't in isolation. And I'm just interested about that role of um, the servants, if you like, who choose to, to enter into these uh, rituals around her so that it becomes not just a singular Wonder Woman event, but a community event. Thank you, Megan. That's really helpful. It's a, it's a really... How Esther relates to her community is a really interesting thing because she is quite isolated, stuck in the palace, in the harem, whereas the community are all outside. And you have that uh, bit that I was describing earlier where when she has that conversation with Mordecai, which launches the whole kind of um, narrative of, of saving the Jews, um, it's all done through intermediaries. And yet at the end of that, she calls for people to fast with her. So there's, there's something about isolation and Esther is quite an isolated figure um, for large tracts of the book, but also about finding ways to, um, finding ways to engage with community or to bring community alongside. Um, some of that I think is about Esther needs early on to actually identify herself with her people. I think that that temptation of keeping herself isolated and, and therefore hopefully safe, um, she needs to identify with her people. So almost the first, the first fast is about, it is for Esther's sake to be part of the people. Um, to help Esther be part of, of her own people. Um, but there's but it's also really interesting that it is the folks on the out on the on the fringe of the court that help Esther to maintain those links and to grow those links with her own people. Um, I don't know whether that quite answers your question, Megan, but um, any, any other questions at all? Simon, thank you. Could you subscribe to me the God implicitly part of Esther and especially what is the uniqueness of that implicit God within the context of the canon of the Holy Scripture? Um, I'll give it a go, Simon. That's a really big question. Um, I think the God that's implicit is a God that is at work in the world, but rarely recognized um, and only, and sometimes only seen in retrospect. I think the God that is seen is clearly a God that has called the people of Israel to be his and is with them, even when they can't see it. And I think it's a God who works. It's not just that God works through those on the outside. It's almost that um, God God himself has to follow where is the place that there is a way of working here. And it's Esther, um, who is not um, the most expected character to be the way the, the person through whom God is acting. Um, but I don't want to to make that a kind of glib and easy God works through unexpected people kind of comment. It's, it's almost that God himself has to work his tactics out and God's tactics are in this case, 
Esther is the person who can do this. Um, in a, in a way, I guess, that we find in the book of Isaiah that Cyrus becomes the person who can do it. Mm. And there's another person who, you know, in many ways shouldn't be. But, but Cyrus is the first person named as Messiah, as anointed one in the scriptures. Because um, God has anointed him to do, to do the work of bringing down Babylon and setting Israel free. So thank you for that. Excellent answer. I mean, I think we've all heard it, but I've heard it two or three times in the last couple of days from significant people. Never been so much anxiety in the Church of England as right now, all this anxiety. And I'm bound to say, you know, if we all read the book of Esther, you know, with our anxiety. And, what, you know, somebody said to me, I mean, that the line was, I'm not sure that God is anxious about the Church of England, but he does want us to know he's faithful and to trust him. And it's not obvious our anxiety is that we do actually trust God. Thanks for that, Stephen. Simon even, sorry. I'm just noticing time, and we did say we'd spend the last little while looking at some of the overlaps between the two books. Is that right, Simon? Yeah, we said we'd try and bring some stuff together. Um, and when we talked about this, Rona, you said, well, the first thing that, that came up was, was actually the Holocaust. Yeah, yeah. So I think I said at the beginning that um, by my bed I've got a picture of Esther and actually it is just the history of anti-Semitism going back to Esther. And you can't read a trauma book without really encountering the Holocaust as significant trauma. And many of the people that went into trauma work actually were Holocaust survivors, first or second generation. Uh, there's a fantastic book called The Choice by Edith Eager, who was a Holocaust survivor, a very powerful book about trauma and about resilience and a powerful Wonder Woman. So there is a huge overlap between the two. I think, Simon, you, we also said that there was an overlap in the area of anti-Semitism, racism and sexism and that, that being experienced as trauma and being an Esther. Yes, and, and, and you mentioned Ben Lindsay's stuff before, and what, what I found really interesting was that Esther is, is a book that's, that's not very often um, read. So Walter Brueggemann's huge and really uh, brilliant theology of the Old Testament doesn't mention Esther at all, doesn't fit with the theology of the Old Testament. And yet people like Ben Lindsay, people who've been looking at uh, Me Too in the, in the context of Christia Christianity and the church, um, Azariah France Williams, all of these people find the book of Esther as a resource mm. because it is about being, facing down some really intractable and structural um, evils um, that, um, which is exactly where Esther is. Um, and so that's that's why they there's much more mention of Esther in that kind of literature than there is in most Christian theology that's written. Mm, yeah. Yes, and um, and the whole issue of of generational trauma, mm. which kind of links in the racism and and the anti-Semitism, the Holocaust. So within the Holocaust survivor community people are defined by the generations the book I mentioned by Sophie Richards Mending the Muse she is a holocaust survivor she, and you just look at the generations and she looks at what happened to her daughter as well and the links as a result of that and with racism we see the um the way that history impacts on the experience of people of color today mm. We also mentioned um, Ukraine. Yeah. Um, I think there are some walls that, that turn me into a pacifist, um, but then there are walls that really make me think this, this is a war that needs to be fought. And I, I kind of feel that the Ukraine war is, is one of those. Um, because it's about standing up to naked aggression. Um, 
and I wonder what happens if we try and be too kind of pure about that. What does it turn us into? I mean, there's all, there's already a danger of it because we're so far away from it. I mean, I know that um, there's there's lots of prayer and solidarity solidarity going on, and people are fantastically welcoming refugees. Um, but um, the war is going to continue for a long while, and it's not going to be pretty. But the danger of, of not engaging was that we just end up as bystanders. Yes. And again, there's the whole connection with how we are, can be bystanders, our own use of power as individuals today, how we can stand by and do nothing. And that kind of parallels very much with the bystanders within the Holocaust. Um, what does it mean to collude? What does it mean to stand by and do nothing? And what does it mean to be someone who acts justly, loves mercy and walks humbly with God? Yeah. And I think that's why Esther is a helpful book because it's not neat on these things. And it, you know, there is hard struggle to go through. And there's also adapting. So I was struck by what Megan was saying earlier about the change in behavior mm. as a result of what's going on, what that change of behavior is going to be like in different contexts and in different places and in different times. And actually, how do we as the church understand that change of behavior? Uh, how do we discern God's call? How do we identify what the need is? Like you say in your book, you know, call, need and calling into action. How do we discern God's call? How do we discern the need? And how do we call each other into action? And it's not easy, it's not clear, it's not messy, it's uncertain, which leads us back to what you're saying about the examine and the discernment and the sneaking to discern the call of God. I think it's really interesting that you now both of our books are in many ways the product of COVID. Um, but COVID, there are now, there are more and more traumatic events coming upon us, and it doesn't seem to be letting up. And it it's really um, it's really great. It's really humbling to have Megan with us to and to hear the stories of Christchurch um, and earthquakes and shootings. And and now it's been a it's been traumatic event after traumatic event, and we haven't you know we're only just beginning to face into the real challenges of climate change and the climate yeah. emergency. Um, and there is trauma to go through there, even under, I think, some of the best possible solutions, they will be pretty hard. Um, and that leads in again to the natural trauma with earthquakes and floods and everything else. Strange, so we're talking about Psalms as well and the Psalms of Lament and needing to lament. And often in workshops, we get people to write a Psalm of Lament using Psalm 13 as a model. There's also the need for us to have Psalms of hope, like Psalm 126, those who sow in tears will reap the songs of joy. And for me, that's a go-to, but also Psalm 23, just knowing the Lord our shepherd. Yeah. And I think, you know, it is through the valley of the shadow of death, there is a restoration. And I hadn't realised until quite recently that actually I'd assumed that this green pasture was nice grass and the waters were kind of nice little streams that we get in the UK, where of course in the Holy Land, the shepherd is having to move each day to get to the grass, to get to the water. And it's daily provision. It's one step at a time, which again reflects what we've been saying. That feels like a really good place to end, one step at a time, looking for the good pasture. Thank you everyone for, for coming and being part of this. Rona, thank you so much for, for 
joining in with this and, and for giving us your wisdom and telling us about your research. It's really good to have done this. Um, Rona's book, Mission in a Time of Trauma, and my book for just such a time as this are both available from the Grove Books website. Um, and um, thank you. And it's we have, I'm going to stop the recording now and hopefully I will work out how to to put that onto a uh, to a recording. We'll we'll put it up.